this horse act. You see, it was like this. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Furniture on the Men. I'm Ed Feldman. And I'm Joe Lorario. Today we'll be delving inside of our chaise lounge into the vastness and depth of the worlds of springs and webbing. You are so full of hyperbole. Raw onions. <laughs> and in our wood section, we're going to be continuing with the uh, with our distressing process, and we'll be doing the actual distressing on the frame of the chaise. Excellent. We'll also be visiting an antique showroom and discussing some of the pieces that we find there. Oh, a whole chock full of antiques. Really pretty stuff. Let's get going. So, uh, there was there something wrong with the tape? The tape was, was rolling like backwards, backwards or something? Uh, Remember last week, we took apart our chaise. We stripped it, we took off the padding and the fabric and the coils and webbing. Now we have to start over from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. First thing we need is a platform on which to set those coil springs. That's the underside of the chaise here. And this is what we're using, burlap webbing. It's on a big roll and we're gonna tack it to both ends and make a nice weave out of it and that'll be our solid base platform. For the springs to sit on. The other thing we're gonna use to attach that webbing is a, an electric staple gun. Remember in previous shows I was using a red one. This is a brown one and it also has an extended nose. Yeah, so do you. We're also using upholstery shears. Nice, sharp, brand new brand upholstery new. shears that are sharp. Use sharp ones, you don't want to use dull ones. Station paid for them. And a webbing stretcher. This is a nasty looking implement, but it's, it comes in, it's real neat for uh, pulling the webbing tight from the other side. From the side incorporated. To make it tight like a drum. Okay, now the, fir the first thing we do is we put in a lengthwise, a lengthwise. Run, run of webbing so because we're going to be weaving and we want to weave side to side rather than lengthwise because it's easier. You want right. to center it, put it right in the middle and we also want them running parallel. Now some previous civilization named Joe I did that. Made, uh, made marks so for us to straight, center. I did that. See, we pull, we pull the top tight and we fold it over. Here is a gun. Thank you. And when tacking, you want to tack at a slight angle. Why? That's so it doesn't split the wood. And they stay in better. And they way. stay in better. What kind of staples am I using? I'm using 9 sixteenths staples. And I'm putting in a double, a row. double row. Right. That should hold just fine. Beautiful. Now we're going to stretch. Now get in the center again. Here's the technique. Can I move? Use that webbing see stretcher. That? See put how it, it fits right in there? Put it about at a 45 degree angle. Spike it through. You see the little babies coming through there? And pull down. And now pull. Pull down until it's flush with the frame on which Good. you want to tack. Here again, double row of slightly angled staples. And then with your very sharp Take the shears, stretcher away. You want to give a little snoop. And to finish it off. Fold it over and watch my fingers, please. All right, very, very tight. Now we're going to do a second run. Second run. run. So. Second run, the only difference is we've got a curve here. So when we fold over, we're just going to fold over slightly at an angle on the bias, as we say. And a gun, gun, please. And remember, you want to leave enough room so for the width-wise webbing to be woven through, but not so much room that you won't have a solid platform. Move make your hand, please. Make sure that gap right, is straight. First I want to spike through. And now we have a straight gap, and then I pull down. And go. Now we've reached, we've reached a leg. What kind of legs are these? These are patterned after Louis XVI. Uh, but no heads, see? He had funny legs. Um, we have to cut around this leg. As you can see, I gave a little snoop here, a little snoop there, fold it over and tack both sides. Okay. Do the same down here. Following down, we've but, got to cut around this leg. But we want to pull this taut a little bit. First pull taut. And you didn't teach me this. Okay. Now, now I give a little snoop. A little snoop. A little bigger snoop, actually. Pardon my forearm. Pardon my sarong. Evan Costello, 1947, I think. All right, leave out, fold back. 
pull once again. Move your manly four on. It is manly, isn't it? No. Okay. I'm gonna try with my machine. Did you ever have an old lady say to you when you were a kid, don't go out in the street, you'll get hit by a machine? Yes. We started in the middle, and as we go out towards the end, we realize not enough room for one big full, full, full piece of webbing. Right. So what we've done, we've cut one in half lengthwise. On the other side, we had the same problem. We folded it in half. What's the correct way? I don't know. You do what works. Whatever works for you. I folded you it. Absolutely. Right. So we do as before. Fold on the bias. Now we're ready for our... With wise webbing weaving. Ooh, you put another word in there. Okay. Right. Because? This time, we're not starting in the center with a piece. Because if we did, as you can see from laying out swatches like so, we'll end up with halfsies and all kinds of pain. It'll be horrible. So as I've laid out before with these small swatches, we're going to put four in the middle there. Running parallel with the brace of the frame. Exactly. The brace of the frame. The brace of the frame. And I'm gonna weave. Mr. Joe. Under, over, under, over, going up and down like a porpoise. Yes. And there is a porpoise behind us. Now sometimes you'll have to adjust this so it's, it's nice and straight. Go parallel Nice today. and straight. Now I take my gun. You know, I have a nickname for this staple gun. Oh, please. I call her Maureen. Why? Well, Maureen staple gun, of course. Maureen staple gun. Insert. Can you hear that creaking door sound? And now, a snoop. Beautiful, look at that. Watch the defense. Hey. Furniture on the Mend will return on TLC. Furniture on the Mend now returns on TLC. Done all the webbing. It's tight as a drum. Nice and tight. Hey, yeah, Gene Krupa. Gene Krupa. Sing, sing, sing. What we've done is we've cut an extra thin strap that across, goes... Right over top of the brace. That's a crossbar. We couldn't put full straps in there because you've got wood underneath. What we've done is is just added it and stapled that in there. For added support and Added comfort. support. I think it is time to cross the border and begin refinishing the frame of the chaise. That's so distressing. If you remember last week, we put on our last layer of gray, which is the gray that you now see. Underneath that, remember, we have a darker gray. Underneath that, we have our primer, which had a little black into it, so it also was a gray. And underneath that, we have the actual green that was on the chaise to begin with. What we're gonna do is this, uh, we're gonna distress with a paste remover. And unlike the last distressing, as I said, uh, where we beat the piece of furniture up, this one we're gonna do with a paste remover, removing some of the layers of paint through the action of the paste and varnish remover. So let's begin now. Get most of the remover off the brush. And you just want to apply a little bit. This finish is still practiced today on new furniture. And now I want to pat some of it off. Trying to stay away from the fluting inside the fluting. See, I'm, remember I'm patting here. I'm not painting as I would paint paint and dabbing. You might be able to see it bubbling already. This finish is still practiced today on new furniture. See, now I want to pat some of it off. I'm trying to stay away from the fluting inside the fluting. See, I'm, remember, I'm patting here. I'm not 
painting as I would paint paint. It looks about ready now. So a little more padding here. Now we're ready to use the whisk broom. Whisk broom, the bristles are very coarse, of course. Right, Ed? Right, Wilbur. Actually hitting the paint to peel it off. You can also use this little, little stick. Let me get some of those nice green highlights from the old paint. I think it looks aged. Now, some people may be saying, what the heck is he doing? What the heck is he doing? Just like <laughs> But believe me, this is a bona fide finish. That's about all I want to do right now because all of these little cracks, all these little bubbles, once this is dry, we're going to go over them with some 220 paper or some 100 paper and we'll actually be pulling down over the bubbles of the paint and further removing the paint to expose colors. But now this has to dry. Any more work you do on it, you'll just pull too much paint off. There's some nice green coming through there. So leave it alone already. Hey, I, I want to see what that other guy is doing there. You know, the one with the manly forearms. <sighs> all right, our bed of uh, webbing is all attached, nice and firm. Ready now to lay in our coil springs. Coils. This is a coil spring. This part's going to go on the bottom. This is the closed end of the coil spring. And on the top, we have an open end of a coil spring. And that always faces up. Why use coil springs? Yeah. Few reasons. It's what we found in the chaise when we took it apart. We want to be faithful. Authentic. And uh, they're also the best. They give the best support. They're better than other kinds of springs, and they're certainly better than just laying in a lot of foam, which will disintegrate after a and while. And you can get these at your local uh, upholstery supply house. Just take the old coil out, take it back, and say, I need 36 of these or 100. Whatever. A hundred, ooh. Maybe huh? you're doing three pieces. A big chaise. Big chaise. Now, Andre the Giant's chaise. <laughs> I am George the Animal Steel myself. Yeah, the daddy. <laughs> so when you, when you figure out how many you need, and you might have to measure and figure out how many go across and how, how many go up and down, then you can go in and estimate the amount of springs you need. Now, before you begin to tie, you want to lay them all in, end to end. Fill it out exactly as it will be so you know which way to tie. We're gonna lay four across all the way up. So let's Let lay us those coils begin. in, boy. When we lay those coils in, we're going to position them so that this open end is at 10 o'clock or two o'clock. Because when we tie that coil, we're gonna tie across here mm -hmm. and across here. Like a crosshair. Exactly, and we don't want that twine to cut, to get cut at this sharp end. So we're gonna lay this, as I said, 10 o'clock or two o'clock, and we're tying this way and this way. Let's put them in. Begin. We're ready to set the springs. With this. What is this? If it is a spring setter. And we call him Arnold. It is long, it is big, and it is $72. It's very powerful. And what it does is it shoves one of these little spiky things through the bottom of the springs, then spreading it out through the webbing to secure it deeply and firmly. And, and anchoring it firm, as this one has already been anchored. You talk funny. OK, let's get going. We've, we have one row of springs, and I'm going to set them. I've set this one already. I'm going to set them in three points, triangulation. Lift it up. You are right there. So, yes, yeah, set it so that the spikes are pointing down oh. and press. Beautiful. Now I'm moving over to this side, pulling again. Sometimes you'll have to adjust slightly. I got it. 
And again over here. Need some music, I think. Maybe some Art Tatum. How about the Rites of Spring? The Rites of Spring, that would be good. Springtime for Hitler. Furniture on the Mend will return on TLC. Furniture on the Mend now returns on TLC. Now, the distressing is dry, the paste remover part. You can see how nicely it's bubbled, and I've whisked away with the whisk broom, removing the top coat and revealing the gray underneath and the gray, and the uh, green, rather. And now I'm going to scrape with a razor blade. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it at a 45. I'm not going to hold it straight. And I'm just going to pull a little bit. This is going to reveal a little bit more the undercolors. And I will make no attempt to go inside the fluting here because that aging process, natural aging process, would not go into the fluting. And then you can sand with some paper. Now it's, this is 220 garnet paper. Let's see, this is some 100 grit. Let's see what this does. Oh my God, look what he's doing to that nice paint. I can hear everyone saying that. But I have done this many times. Rococo furniture takes this very well. You can even take big chunks off if you want. What a creative process this is. You can just invent things as you go along, as long as you stick to the basic rules. Don't use latex primers, and then put oil over top. This doesn't work as well with latex. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint some highlights over top of the distressing. The reason I'm using a foam brush is because there's no bristles. That's obvious. Bristles would tend to get into the fluting, and as I said, I don't want to get anything in there. Now, if you like the effect without applying another coat of paint, just you can varnish right over top of it. And that looks just fine. I like this. As I said, I'm going to sand this down lightly, apply a semi-gloss furniture varnish, and then once that's dry, I'll buff it with some 4-0 steel wool, lay on a nice wax, and give it the gleam of the ages. All right, let us recap. Well, we put a new bed of webbing in our chaise, and we secured the coil springs to the webbing. And you whisked, you scraped, and you sanded the frame of the chaise. That's right, and I guess that's it for today, uh -uh, huh? uh 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 What do you mean? Here comes the road trip uh -huh. graphic. We're gonna talk about furniture again. Okay. Here we are in the middle of the 19th century. The Renaissance. Well, it's a Renaissance revival. Right. Uh, due to modern production techniques brought around about by the uh, Industrial Revolution, what we have in the middle of the 1900s is a series of revivalist styles. That means that uh, reproductions were made of classical styles, styles from the Gothic era, from the Jacobean and, in the this Tudor, case... And the Tudor. And the Tudor and the Fordor. And this is a Renaissance revival piece. The thing that identifies the Renaissance element is that, that beautiful lion head. And if you were able to look at all four of those heads, they're all different, which means they were all hand-carved. Symbol of power, very popular in the Renaissance and the revival period. Right. Now, now, what's the top? The top is beautiful. Uh, 
quarter sawn piece of veneer. What is now, quarter sawn? What is quarter sawn? It, people call it today, some people call it tiger oak. It's not made from a tiger. Silly. It's made from an oak tree. And what it is, the tree is actually quartered. And then from those quartered halves, there's parallel boards or parallel boards are cut from those quartered halves. You get a very and interesting. And you get this, this sidewards uh, effect of the grain. Now, uh, in originally, this uh, the finish probably would have been fumed. Yeah, a lot of times uh, that kind of furniture, especially furniture that was made with oak, they would build a big tent for it, place the piece in a tent, and then they would put these large vats of ammonia. Now, the gas, unseen to the naked eye, would envelop the tent mm -hmm. and turn the oak black, because why? The ammonia gas reacted with the tannic in the wood. That detailing on the edge there is an egg and dart molding. Now, what is an egg and dart molding? I don't know. It's a molding that was created in the 16th century, and it still prevails today. You can find new egg and dart molding in any store uh, for, you know, a nominal price. The horse was stupid. He couldn't even add two and two. Yeah, well, neither could Happy either. <laughs> yeah. Man, Phil, I'm tired of walking around. Let's go catch a show That's or just something. the point. This town is dead. There's no place to go. The horse was really stupid. He couldn't even add two and two. Yeah, well, neither could Happy either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm tired of walking around. Let's go catch a show. Well, something. that's just the point. This town is dead. There's no place to go.